So, uh, welcome to the Total Bitcoin Podcast Show. My name is Kevin Davani. I'm really looking forward uh, to a talk with Parker Lewis, whom I've been, you know, waiting for a long time. Uh, he's a colleague of Phil Geiger from Unchained Capital. They're both really brilliant minds. Uh, have written, you know, beautiful articles. Uh, some of them uh, you should definitely read them yourself. Bitcoin is not a pyramid scheme. Bitcoin, Bitcoin cannot be copied. Bitcoin is not backed by nothing. Bitcoin is not for criminals. Bitcoin cannot be banned. So there's, you know, a, a, a range of articles you should read for yourself. It, it will really goes deep into the rabbit hole and you get a really bigger and, and, and much more, you know, uh, a detailed understanding comprehension of why Bitcoin, what are the root causes, um, you know, what, what are the monetary properties of Bitcoin? Why is it, uh, yeah, an inevitable necessity, as um, as uh, Parker Lewis says. So, yeah, uh, without further ado, um, if you like it, love it, please share it, follow me, subscribe. And I would uh, also, you know, really appreciate any kind of feedback or positive review. So, yeah. This is my interview with Parker Lewis. Thank you so much and talk to you soon again. Bye. So, Parker, thanks so much for your time. Welcome to the Total Bitcoin Show. My very special guest, Parker Lewis. Um, how are you doing, man? Doing well. Thanks for having me on. Uh, I know I've been trying to do this for a couple months now, but uh, glad that it finally worked. Uh, all the things that you talk about on, on the podcast are things that I'm interested in. So. Um, always wanted to come on, but glad that we could finally make it happen. Yeah, eagerly. I've been waiting for this because I've been having a talk with uh, your colleague here from Unchain Capital, uh, Phil Geiger. It was also a very, uh, you know, um, educational talk, very exciting. So, listen, Mark, yeah, he, he I, came on. He came on about a month ago. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I yeah. remember listening to it, but I couldn't remember exactly when it was. Exactly. So, um, Parker, so uh, I listened to the interview also you did with uh, Marty Bent. I had to re-listen to it like, I don't know, two or three times. And uh, it, it was so succinct that I had to re-listen, re-listen. So can you maybe for, for, the, uh, for, for, for my listeners um, do a, like a short summary of what, what is the, like, the, the essential messages in that interview you gave with Marty Bent? Because I think it's really important what's going on. Yeah, I, I think that the... If there is one takeaway, um, or you know, to 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 abbreviate some of the discussion that I have with Marty, essentially what happened from 2009 to 2017 was that the Fed increased the size of of its balance sheet by approximately 3.6 trillion, from around 900 billion to to 4.5 trillion. Then from the period from October of 2017 through the, the summer of 19 into September of 2019, the, the Fed started to drain $50 billion a month from, from its balance sheet. And that ultimately resulted in 700 billion in total being removed from the US economy and ultimately the global economy. And as the dollar is not only the, the largest economic system in the world, it's also the largest funding currency and is the largest you know, source of credit in the world. And so essentially what had happened was Fed um, went from extremely easy mo monetary policy to um, draining liquidity very quickly and having reduced approximately 700 billion of liquidity out, out of the system over the course of October 2017 to September 2019, uh, eventually, one of the short-term funding markets, that, which is a very large market, the repo market, um, in, in my terminology, it, it, it just broke. Um, suddenly, overnight, rates spiked um, from 3% to somewhere between 9 and 10%, depending on where you look at, at the marks. And essentially, what that means is for the repo market is a very large funding market, and suddenly, there were no lenders in that market, or there were, but the the rates at which those uh, that it was required to induce sufficient liquidity to satisfy the demand um, suddenly increased significantly. And so um, overnight, the people that were paying for liquidity in that market, their rate of interest doubled to uh, to nearly tripled. And as a result, um, the Fed had to come back in 
and start putting liquidity back into the system as a whole, but specifically the, to that market to stave off uh, essentially a, a run on, on, on that market that would have bled into other markets. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So how long can this but, go but, on? But, but, if, yeah. but, but, but if, you, if I abstract that to a higher level, mm -hmm. what it ultimately means is there, there's one thing that Q, quantitative easing. Quantitative easing was the, the, the increase in the size of the balance sheet. From, and it, it's not just the Fed. I'm more familiar with the Fed, so I have these numbers on the top of my head. But what the Fed's doing, the ECB is doing, exactly. to probably yeah. a, uh, a, a worse, mm -hmm. and, and, yeah, it, it's more pervasive um, for a number of reasons. And the Bank of Japan may be the worst of them all. So, you know, I usually talk um, specifically about the Fed because it's something that, you know, really going down the, the rabbit hole, that's where I spent most of my time, but it's the exact same rabbit hole. So what the, the things that are systemic and involved with the Fed are, 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 you know, it's equally as true for the ECB, maybe different, but true. And then, and then similar for the BOJ, but the, the, the high level takeaway is that it's, it's really a dynamic of there is too much debt in the system and in order to be able to satisfy that amount of debt, the, the Fed, the ECB, the BOJ, they will always have to put more dollars, more euros, more yen into the system. The whole system is based on credit. That is the, the source of demand for the base money. But ultimately, QE, it, it can only solve a problem one way. It can only solve a problem by inducing more credit to be created. Um, the, the, you know, it's the solution to, there is too more, too much debt. So we need more base currency, but that base currency that they put in the system, the only way it's designed to work is to actually increase the total amount of debt. Um, and then it, it's kind of a vicious cycle. Okay. We have too much debt. We need more dollars or we have too much Euro debt. We need more euros. And then they, they supply more dollars or euros. And then the, the size of the credit system expands from there. And so it's kind of a constant push and pull type system. Ultimately, it, it will end very badly, but it is the dynamic between the, the size of the credit system and the size of the underlying uh, base money that you know, a lot of people could look at it you know, from the outside and say, well, how can the ECB create 5 trillion euros? Or how could the, you know, and I don't know that's a specific amount. I think it's, it's something between three and four trillion euros, or how could the Fed create 3.6 trillion euros and not see this instant um, and, and, you know, by orders of magnitude inflation. And really the, the reason for that is, is because it's always about the relationship between the amount of actual base money and the size of the credit system and in either system, whether it's uh, the Euro, the, the dollar or the yen's financial system, the marginal price setter is the credit system because the, the, there is so much more credit uh, than there is actual base money. Mm -hmm. what, what's the, what's the, what's the actual base money? Uh, let's uh, just to stay in the United States. What would, what would, what would that be? Because I was, I was surprised I think at the figures, was it like 1.6 or 1.7 so, trillion? And it, it, this is something else that, you know, kind of, it's important to, to think about not all base money is the same and especially not, as it relates to the banking system, so right now um, I, I'd have to I'd have to check, but because the Fed's increasing the, the base money very rapidly, so uh, the the Fed. If we start with the Fed's balance sheet, the Fed's balance sheet is somewhere around 4.2 trillion, okay, but um, and, and essentially what that is is there's you know on one side of the Fed's balance sheet there's factor supplying reserves, factor supplying dollars. And then the, there's the other side, which is, well, where are those, where are those dollars? And so in the, in the banking system today, again, depending on what the Fed has done in the last month, which has been fairly extreme, the, the amount of cash in the banking system is somewhere around, you know, two to 2.2 2 tri trillion. Before when the repo market broke, it was 1.6 trillion. The Fed has since increased, you know, depending on, you know, stick your finger up what day of the week it is, has, has put in approximately 400 million to 500 million, or billion, sorry, 
of new dollars such that the, um, the, the banks now have between two to 2.2 .2 trillion. But there's this other piece of the Fed's balance sheet, which is, so if the Fed has 4.2 trillion of, of, of reserves that they've supplied to the market, only 2.2 .2 trillion of those exist in the banking system. There's another approximately 2 trillion that exists outside the banking system. So that is, as you know, I go, yeah, if I think about it at a micro level, if I go take money out of the bank, and I don't put it back in the bank, then that money essentially converts from a reserve to a physical note. Uh, it's still a factor for supplying a reserve in terms of the Fed's balance sheet, but mo for, for most purposes, dollars that come out of the banking system and that don't re-enter. So approximately, and this is a crazy number, but approximately 90 billion a year net is taken out of the banks just by people demanding cash. Because that's another thing that people generally don't understand. It, it, it should be fairly obvious, but the dollar in your that, that's underneath your mattress or that's in your hand is very different than the deposit that's sitting in your bank account. Uh, one has one level of counterparty risk, one has two. But um, I, I bring that point up because oftentimes people look at the Fed's balance sheet or the ECB and they think about that as, oh, well, there's this much money in the system. The, the, the money that, that sits outside the banking system can't really service the liabilities that exist in the, in the banking system. So it's, it's, on one side, it's important to look at, well, what is the total situation, which is the, the Fed's balance sheet and the factor supplying reserve, which are 4.2 trillion ish today. Um, but the more important piece as it relates to the banking system is the, the cash that the banks actually have. So I think about that as the left side of the bank's balance sheet, the actual reserves or physical cash that the banks hold, because their that liquidity source in aggregate is ultimately what can satisfy the liabilities that exist in the banking system such that if they're, you know, if they're, if, if the banks in total have 2.2 .2 to 2.2 .2 trillion of, of cash, but there's 73 to 75 trillion of, of debt and, and you know, financial debt, it's not the 4.2 that can satisfy the, the 75, it's, it's the two. And what happened when the Fed was shrinking the size of its balance sheet, it had ultimately taken approximately 30% of all liquidity out of the system. And that ultimately, you know, very logically, very predictably, you know, it becomes unpredictable when you want to pick the day of the week or the market specifically that breaks, but very obviously that if you have a very good <laughs> leverage system, okay, by stripping out 30 to 40% of liquidity, depending on how you look at liquidity, um, and liquidity impacts different markets in different ways, um, and, and, and markets fragment, that that the logical end game of QE is there will just always be more dollars or more euros or more yen because the solution that is QE can only can only cause one thing can only, can only be successful in one way which is to expand the size of the overall credit system which then ultimately dictates the need for for more QE. Got it. Okay. So um, we'll come back I think to to some of the details later on, but. Um, is it correct to say that this, this whole cancerous, you know, debt credit based system is so intricately interconnected, interlocked with one another? I mean, could, could we say that, um, w is there, is there some of an assessment, like, uh, maybe even within the unchained capital, have you done studies like where could this crash, uh, first, is it going to be you or, uh, I mean, are there like projections uh, for this? No, I mean, I think I think that there's probably some sophisticated hedge funds out there that have that have views. Um, I, you know, I, I I don't particularly I don't have a view. Um, you know, I think that the the way that I approach uh, my you know not only my time but my thinking is like I know that this is out there, um, and you. Know, it's almost like tr not trading, not trading in the sense of, of day trading, but in terms of how, how you operate, operate through those things. Know that, you know, it, at some point there is going to be another financial crisis just by the, the setup. If, if you become paralyzed such that you're always focused on it, um, rather than 
figuring out to say, okay, if this is an inevitability, I don't know exactly what that looks like. I don't know if it's going to be as bad as 2008. Obviously, the Fed has jumped in far quicker today to, to try to, to stem that tide. I think that I think it, I do think that it's an inevitability, but I also don't say, okay, well, you know, when does this happen and where exactly does it happen? Because ultimately what I believe is that Bitcoin is the solution to it. And so I could sit around and worry about, you know, the how, what, or when of it. But if, you know, if I think about playing through that wave, that the, the place that makes the most sense to focus my own time is not to get hung up necessarily on that, to pay, be cognizant of it, to be pay attention to it because it will impact all of us. Um, and I think people have to certainly have to plan for, for that end state, but they don't necessarily need to, you know, be wondering uh, because I think then it becomes a, it, it just becomes counterproductive. Whereas if you can focus on what, what you ultimately think is, is the fix, it doesn't matter when everybody else figures it out. Is that that's just the, the the force of gravity and the the time function you know right. will take care of itself. Got it. Uh, so let's go to your articles, your amazing articles. Um, um, let me see where that is. Uh, oh, there we go. So you've written really some amazing articles that went pretty viral in my opinion i send it to all, all kinds of people of, of mine and you know for comprehension because it's about comprehension it's like levels of comprehension um let me see let me put this here so i'm not sure the order the consecutive order of your articles but one of them is bitcoin is not a pyramid screen uh, uh, bitcoin is not a pyramid scheme the other one bitcoin cannot be copied bitcoin is not backed by nothing and Bitcoin is not for criminals. Is there any other article I left out, like that is uh, should have mentioned? Uh, I mean, I, I think I've put out eleven or twelve to this point, uh, but we don't, <laughs> we, we, don't, we don't need to work through all of them. But um, you know, they can they can all be found on the uh, the Unchained Capital blog. Uh, but I, I do try to make them pretty uh, self-contained, so there is there is some repetition in terms of themes from you know from one to one, but they all try to articulate a particular point and work through that kind of logical, uh, that, you know, generally mental block um, within each article so that someone can understand, you know, whether, you know, well, why isn't it for criminals or why, you know, why is it not a pyramid scheme? Uh, and they're not necessarily all focused on, on debunking some flaws thinking around Bitcoin, but, but most of them are. And I, I really just, you know, structured it that way because, and I, and I really didn't intend to do it, but then as I started to, that, as I started to write, and, and as I started to look at the, you know, just in terms of other things that have been written about Bitcoin, and, and as I was going around and having conversations both with uh, clients or potential clients, it, you know, the, I think all of us experience it because most of us who have gotten to the point of our own understanding have had to, to pass through a lot of those kind of key fundamental questions as to, to what right. Bitcoin is and what Bitcoin isn't. Right. So I wrote down, uh, you know, I sent you my, you know, my questions, my list of questions. I have a bunch of questions. Uh, the more I read it, because I read, I read, I think each one of your articles at least twice. So, um, so when you say, yeah, so one of the most important article, Bitcoin is not backed by nothing. In that article, you wrote about the, the sort of the dollar scarcity or versus the Bitcoin or absolute scarcity of Bitcoin. Um, and the supply of Bitcoin is entirely divorced from the function of credit. And I thought that's very important for, you know, for everybody, for every noob, for every Bitcoin beginner or listener to understand that, you know, that the supply of Bitcoin is entirely divorced or separated from the function of credit. And, that, and also, you know, what I lo also loved is that you went into detail about the credibility of monetary properties. And... And what my, my question, I think, is uh, credibility of monetary properties, understanding the credibility of monetary properties in relation to the, you know, the critical adoption phase, so cr critical adoption rate. Um, do you want to, you want to, like, go a little bit deeper into this, this topic? Yeah, so I think the, you, when I talk about, absolute scarcity versus relative scarcity in that article you know, before, before 
before even getting there, one of the one of the key points to you know, especially for people that are new to Bitcoin, you know, it's just this concept of what what is money, you know, and it, it is something that you know, and maybe the best singular thing about Bitcoin is that it forces people, if they actually want to understand it, to to ask that question. Like that almost has to be to be the the first question, and more people that that look at that problem and more more than just for a few kind of shallow seconds that you know there are two general explanations because it, it is an uncomfortable topic when people say well, what is money you know some you know it, some people get upset by it even um, and and then when they start to think about it there's two kind of mainstream thought processes around it it is that it's a collective hallucination or that it, you know the that people demand money because you know the government gives it value and, and those you know, those are so shallow in terms of in terms of a thought process if someone just tried to break that down to, to test the assumption of like wait what do you mean we all just magically believe that this thing has value so it does it is yes value is subjective but value is always relative because it is subjective and and then secondarily if people break down the idea that that you know the the dollar has value because the IRS taxes it or because the because the the guys with guns will come you know bang down your door and and again that line of thinking completely breaks down if you know it doesn't it doesn't prove the counterfactual but if you look at all of the countries that, that have militaries the ability to tax governments um, that, that may be repressive uh, that have currencies that have either hyperinflated or or have lost significant purchasing power in their underlying currencies. And so the question is, well, if currencies derive their values as a function of government, why why do these other governments suck so bad at it? And then the, and then the explanation becomes, oh well, that was just monetary mismanagement. It wasn't the the logical end game of every single fiat currency because every fiat currency ultimately has the same underpinning. Various different fiat currency systems are structurally more resilient because other countries have come to hold them as reserve and there, there can be layers of, of mismanagement. But I think the key differentiation between say an Austrian view and a monetarist or a Keynesian view is the idea that any manipulation of the money supply is, is, is ultimately bad. And what you have in fiat systems is, is ultimately just various different degrees of mismanagement, not that there can be better management or worse management. And, and ultimately what that results in and why certain, certain fiat currencies are, you know, have emerged as, as reserve currencies, generally the euro, the, you know, the dollar foremost, the euro, and then the yen, is because their underlying economies that those fiat systems arose from were inherently stronger and then those systems developed uh, you know essentially they, they began as as reserve back currencies and then they slowly transitioned and maybe you know, slow is not the right term but over the course of approximately a century all transitioned from reserve back currencies in some form or fashion to debt back currencies and um, initially and, and, and the important point there is that all of them, all fiat currencies, whether it's the dollar, euro, yen, bolivar, um, lira, peso, none of them are have any inherent monetary properties. Um, and the, the 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 fiat currencies that are stronger than the weaker ones, they all have large credit systems that you know ultimately allowed the um, the, the, the underlying currency to become divorced from what so it was formally quote backed by gold or some base metal and it was a you know fractional representation and then it transitioned you know slowly that ability to convert to, to gold or, or another base metal became restricted and at that point in time there was sufficient amount of debt denominated in in the currency itself that the the quote backing of that currency became the debt the debt becomes the, the future source of demand. And so today in, in all of those systems, the only thing 
you know, that, and I, I don't really like the term backed, but the, the only thing that creates stability in the dollar, the euro, or the yen, or any fiat currency is the relationship between the, the supply of the underlying base money, the, the dollars or the euros, the yen, the left side of the bank's balance sheet or the physical currency in your, um, in, underneath your mattress and the ultimate size of the credit system. And so because of that dynamic, I was talking, it was what we were talking about before with QE, that the dollar is scarce. Like even though the, the Fed has increased the amount of dollars by 500 billion, four to 500 billion in the last three months, the, the demand for the dollars and the need for dollars relative to the actual dollars that exist is very high on a relative basis. But because of that dynamic, it ensures that the absolute amount of dollars will continue to become less and less scarce. And not everybody is, it, is in debt or dependent on staying on that, that dollar hamster wheel. And the more people that figure that out, that say, hey, as this system exists, that the only way it, it, that, that it continues to sustain itself is the relationship between the, the you know, ultimately the, the dollars that exist and the, the dollar debt that exists. And if that ensures that the amount of dollars that exist will continue to grow over time, otherwise the entire system, their whole, the whole credit system collapses. Then over here on this other side, there's Bitcoin. And there's, you know, Bitcoin, one is entirely the, its scarcity and its monetary properties. They're they're both emergent, and then as they've emerged, then they become inherent. Um, and there, it's it's a it's a closed loop system. There is no um, outside credit system that's ultimately designed to create demand for it. Its scarcity, in in, in be it in a digital form, is inherent in and of itself. Originally, that that scarcity and the property of scarcity. You know, it what it was not always the fact that it was it was destined to be scarce, but it's grown to such a level, and the security uh, and the and the, the decentralization the decentralization of that security, which comes in many forms, not just mining, but also the distribution of the ownership of uh, of Bitcoin itself. That that today and in, in each day that uh, Bitcoin survives, and that more and more people adopt it, the more secure that scarcity becomes. And the more divorced from it, you know, any outside system it becomes. And so truly that system and in, in, in what it is in Bitcoin creates absolute scarcity, but also creates what was emergent and now is inherent scarcity versus something like the dollar system or the euro or the yen, where the, the marginal cost to produce dollars, euro, or yen are the, the literal click of a, of a button. So the, the, the marginal cost to create dollars is zero for all intents and purposes, and the nature of the credit system will, will only cause those dollars to become less and less scarce. Mm -hmm. Got it. So for my listeners, I'm going to summarize. Uh, I wrote this actually out of your article sort of as a, as a note. Uh, fixed supply plus increasing adoption equals increasing value. And as the value increases, the adoption increases, or I would call it critical adoption increases and its value increases and Bitcoin becomes further decentralized. And as it becomes more decentralized, it becomes harder to change, reinforcing the credibility of its foundation, its, fit, its fixed supply. And these are your words out of the article. I really love that, how you summarize that. Um, uh, so Park, um, what I was gonna ask you, yeah. So we heard some reports today, you know, you've, you might have heard, um, you know, about this whole crisis in uh, pending, uh, I don't know, looming war uh, or, or the threat of war in Iran. So uh, the reports came of Iran that uh, Bitcoin is trading between twenty four and twenty nine thousand dollars per Bitcoin. So would that mean, you know, some countries like, uh, let's say we don't even need to talk about Iran, but let's say, you know, hyperinflationary countries such as Venezuela. So people go to the most sellable, as Austrian economists would say, you know, most sellable currency. And that would be sort of the dollar, you know, because it's, it's sort of, uh, but it's changing now. People are more and more, I think, uh, you know, having the aha moment and, and, and going more to the, to the hardest scarces and uh, 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 money ever created, and that is Bitcoin. Do you think once, uh, 
I mean, we hope not, you know, that there's not going to be a war erupting or somewhere, you know, in the Middle East or Iran or somewhere. But, you know, the side effect could be people are, but do you think eventually people are going to be more attracted, gravitated towards Bitcoin instead of, you know, looking for other alternatives? And that would sort of, uh, you know, trigger the chain reaction? Yeah, I, I well, I, I think that it's probably, there's, there are, you know, there's a function of time and in a distribution of knowledge. And so there, there, there are probably two ways that Bitcoin gets adopted out of necessity. And um, for those, you know, for those who are put in that situation, whether, you know, whether it be in Venezuela and, and they're desperate to search for something because they need something now or for people who have the luxury of being in more presently stable scenarios that generally have access to more information and that can take the time to, to learn about Bitcoin and to understand truly fundamentally you know, why this is a thing and, and, and why it continues to gain strength and why it will likely be a global currency. But I do think that regardless of anything that anybody does individually, that you know, if you operate under the assumption that money is a necessity, money is not a collective hallucination. It's that if you want any semblance of what our current lives look like and, and that you can show up to the grocery store and that there's you know, thousands of different options that require the coordination of hundreds of millions of people, if you want anything, if people just stop and think about the function of money in that way, that they recognize that that money is a tool, and that it is a it is a tool that ultimately was invented by man very organic organically. Um, it was something that, that that collectively people recognized that there was value in in, in in figuring out what the what the good was that that the most people would exchange for, and then that ultimately developed into a pricing system, and that ultimately led to the ability to have highly specialized economies um, and, and for people to benefit from trade and specialization. And so you start with that baseline that money is a necessity. And then, and then the next question becomes, um, well, what's the best money? And the best money is not necessarily the same thing for every person at, at any point in time. Like people will ultimately converge to, to that, that point. But, you know, the, 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 the idea of, well, what is the best money for a person at a point in time? You know, a lot of people say, well, Venezuelans would be way better off if they had dollars. Well, most Venezuelans don't have access to dollars, right? And so when you think about well, what is the best money, it, it, it's, it's, it has to do with, well, what is your situation, right? What, you know, every person has an A, B choice. Um, every person doesn't have an A, B, C, D, E, F, you know, all the way to Z choice. And so when you, when you strip that away, it is everyone will converge to Bitcoin because it's something that they can all more reasonably access. And then when you think about the benefit of an economic system that has you know, one common currency that spans across, you know, I, I'm someone who still happens to believe that there will be borders, but that at least in terms of um, there will be one common language because it is something that everyone can generally have access to and that, that can represent a, a common language of value. And so I do think, I, you know, I don't know, you know, whether, you know, it's an event in Iran or an event in Venezuela or capital controls in Argentina, but yes, certainly each one of those events causes people to have to search for the, the tools that they need to, for self-preservation. And, and money is, you know, in our current worlds, you know, one of the most basic necessities. Yes, like water, food, all of those things are, but it is the tool that helps us peacefully get all of those things. And so, you know, over time, as, as there's more disruption in the, in the underlying economies of many disparate places, um, that, that people will logically, when they're searching for that, that solution, they will gravitate to Bitcoin because it is the thing that solves the needs for so many um, diverse people. Mm -hmm. 
Got it. So um, would you say that uh, with the, you know, uh, really accelerating development of the, you know, of the second layer technologies, you know, lightning network and all these issues with privacy security becoming more easier to, you know, to, to handle with, to, to use, uh, uh, do you see uh, clusters of, um, of circle economies evolving, uh, decentralized? you know, like little clusters of on Bitcoin. Yeah, you know, and I, I've, I've seen this debate quite a bit. And, you know, we need you know, we need more circular economies. And I, I, it's something that I haven't spent a lot of time. Yeah, I've certainly thought about it, but it, it's not something that I, I necessarily think is, is, is something in terms of a tangible either solution or problem that we that we need to worry about I, I i do think that you know circularity of the of of the bitcoin economy is something that will happen naturally i think that you know if if i think about my own local economy and that you know if there's you know, two million people generally in this in the city in which i trade on a daily basis for for very basic goods that there needs to be a, a lot greater density of of Bitcoin holding and people willing to accept Bitcoin for for that to be a, a tangible reality. And that the, the first step of that process is people wanting to hold Bitcoin. Um, and so people, you know, before like every individual who owns Bitcoin, and, and generally today, it may not be the case in the future, but generally today, the way that people access Bitcoin for the first time, and not a hard and fast rule, but safe to say greater than 90% or greater than 95%, is somebody who's converting some fiat for Bitcoin. Uh, and, but regardless of how they, they come to get Bitcoin for the first time, maybe, it's they, maybe, maybe it is a, a business sold their service for Bitcoin and that's how they got Bitcoin for the first time, or maybe a friend gave them Bitcoin, but ultimately every individual that, that comes to have the mental view or to, to have the framework that Bitcoin is money, that is the first step to them then turning around and saying, you can pay me directly in Bitcoin. And so whatever or however people come to that, that conclusion, that's what really matters because once there is a, a great enough density of people that are, and especially in, in local, economies or at least in terms of the there, there's sufficient density to to allow you to survive day to day being able to to go and purchase things and i do think that that will increasingly happen over time i you know i do think that as as bitcoin waves you know or is, is adopted generally in waves today that over time those people as they become more confident in, in bitcoin as a as a currency they very logically that the gap between whether I'm earning in dollars and converting it to Bitcoin or getting paid directly in Bitcoin, those two worlds begin to, to blend. I think the importance of a quote circular economy is, is it is more important that there are a billion people that have Bitcoin um, because ultimately those billion people turn into sources of liquidity um, in terms of their goods and services. So what we're talking about is somebody that's willing to save in Bitcoin is then willing to sell their goods and services for Bitcoin. And, and even though we don't think about it today, if that, that sale of goods and services becomes liquidity for Bitcoin and the, the more diverse, so there's two things that are important to, to, to Bitcoin's value, uh, liquidity, but today that liquidity is not very diverse. Um, you know, it's, it's probably more diverse than, than the liquidity liquidity is for gold, but, or, or, um, you know, if you wanted to, you know, if you were living in the United States and you want to get euros, you basically have very few options to, to be able to get that liquidity that you need. But that what's most important is that about a circular economy is that the, the actual liquidity for Bitcoin becomes ever more diverse. You're not just going to, to, to central points to convert in and out of dollars and then, and then using the benefit of, of, of the diversification of dollar liquidity or euro liquidity or yen liquidity. And so, um, but as it relates to, do we need to do things to, to accelerate the, 
you know, Bitcoin circular economy. I don't particularly think so because, you know, and this is, this may, you know, be lending too much on my Hayekian view of, I, I, I just have this sense that, um, or not sense, it's, it's based on logic and reason that as Bitcoin evolves and as it scales, as, you know, Bitcoin goes from being held by 100 million people to 200 million people to 300 million people, the needs of those people is not static. Bitcoin isn't static. And so over time, as Bitcoin grows, the, the demand for the type of services will grow. The number of people working on Bitcoin will grow. And the problem that, that exists at the point in time that, that people are demanding will be solved because there's the function of demand. And so if, if, if there's 500 million people in the world that have Bitcoin and more people want to, to, to be paid in Bitcoin, then somebody's going to develop a payroll system that helps you know, integrate and process you know, distributions of, of Bitcoin to employees every two weeks. Um, but that will only happen when there's a sufficient number of people within a, co a company that want to be paid directly in Bitcoin. And so everything is a function of demand. And, and that's why I think that, you know, people spreading knowledge about Bitcoin and people learning about Bitcoin is, is, the, is the more tangible one foot in front of the other approach that everyone should be thinking about relative to, well, what are all the things that, that, that we need to exist in Bitcoin? Because just the, the mere fact of more people thinking about Bitcoin and working on Bitcoin and saving in Bitcoin will, will cause those things to, to, um, to develop in the normal course. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, excellent. So uh, before we wrap up, a uh, final question, um, uh, Park, you, you, you wrote pretty much lengthy in your article about, um, you know, that uh, the questions of you, you posed a question like, when, when would the government or your know, nation states feel threatened uh, to, in order to think about, you know, banning or restricting or censoring or whatever Bitcoin? Um, when... What what is that what is that tipping point you think I mean uh, when if we want if we tie this in you know maybe with the topic of censorship resistance and privacy fungibility um, when when do you think would that situation be uh, I think you you asked something like could it be with one two or three trillion market valuation um, do, do do you want to comment on that Yeah I, I do think that this is something that it's generally one of those things that, that, that I believe is important for people to think about because I, I, I think that it is an inevitability. Like at some point, the you know, government's attempt to, you know, they realize what's happening and they, they try to resist it in some form or fashion. And that, that likely doesn't apply to, to every, every person or every government, but the, especially for the, the reserve currencies, the dollar, euro, yen, a lot of power is derived through the currency. And so it would be, um, I think. A question of taxation, right? See you now. See you near us. Well, <laughs> taxation, but also like access, you know, like right. PayPal being able to deplatform de an individual or a person or Bank of America saying, hey, sorry, you can't be my customer anymore. Um, like, that is the weaponization of access to the financial system. And the same applies to, um, I remember there was reports a few years back when, when the ECB was talking about instituting negative interest rates, which by the way, are like the ultimate insanity and should anybody that can't understand why negative interest rates don't make any sense, like that's the, probably the first place to, to start. But um, when, when banks in, in Europe started saying, well, okay, well, we're going to just hold the, we'll take the cash yeah. and, and put it in our own vaults. And, you know, well, that didn't happen. Why didn't it happen? Because uh, if, you, if you were to do that, the threat is that you get cut out of the system, right? And that's, that's also the, the beautiful thing about Bitcoin and, and the reason why, you know, the, that censorship resistance piece comes in is that, you know, everyone everyone can connect on a permissionless basis to this network. So, you know, the, the, the two ideas there are that the, the power that's, that is, you know, garnered or 
um, that, that materializes out of the function of the currency comes in many forms. And so, um, and, and on the reverse side of that, it, it comes in the form of, of one, one form of censorship or another. And that is something that is like, I think yeah, the, the, the supply of Bitcoin, the 21 million supply and censorship resistance go, go hand in hand. They, they essentially reinforce each other. Um, that the, the more valuable Bitcoin becomes, it becomes more distributed, more decentralized, and the more censorship resistant it becomes. But then you know, the more censorship resistant it becomes, the more reliable that, that fixed supply it becomes. So thinking about these two systems today is one that, that is based on censorship and derives a lot of power from censorship. And then one is that is, that is uh, inherently decentralized and that at the core of it must be censorship resistant. And that when you when you put those two realities together, it is that not that governments won't try to stop what's happening over here, but that they they likely will only do that at the point in which they truly see it as a as a threat, and that at that point in time, the system when they view it as a threat um, is inevitably. Like, and by definition, not, not just like theoretically, but when they view it as a threat, it is now larger, more decentralized, more valuable, you know, more censorship resistant, harder to stop. Now, that doesn't mean that you know, there is not a possibility that you know, like censorship resistance, there's, there's, no, um, there's no metric system for censorship resistance, how, how censorship resistant is, is enough. The only the only hard and fast rule is more is better, um, and that you know um, over time as Bitcoin decentralizes, that with every with every attack, whether it was Segwit 2x or you know these these other competing systems where people try to to explain oh well, this new version of Bitcoin is better so come over here that um, each each attack on Bitcoin or each attempt to influence it from the outside in and, and, and Bitcoin fending those attacks off ultimately give it strength that it essentially immunizes Bitcoin that that those are those are like we only we don't have a absolute test for censorship resistance we only have market tests and we only get market tests as Bitcoin disrupts certain you know scenarios or companies or markets to cause somebody to want to try to censor it. And then when they can't, then Bitcoin grows in value because people look at it and say, okay, well, if they could overcome that, then you know, it, can, it can overcome a lot more than that. And so ultimately, I don't know what the level is. I, it's probably some psychological level. It's like some, some relationship to gold, right? Or, you know, so I, I don't know, but so my view, it is, it's more important to recognize that the fact that governments will try to do something and they may try to do things less, um, less overtly than more overtly, you know, the likely source of it is they start to put more restrictions on the on-ramps, on off-ramps, which to your point about a circular economy, I think it's less about circularity and it's more about diversification of, of liquidity. But so it's important to be thinking about these future states and what governments do because ultimately as, as a system, um, but ultimately, as individuals within that system, people will, will have to, to, to act to, to create you know, solutions to, to various problems to route around it. And there will be no coordination. It will happen, it will happen naturally or organically because problems are per, being presented. And so while it is an inevitability, I don't think it's particularly valuable to worry about, you know, does it happen when Bitcoin's at three trillion or one and a half or more than the value of gold it is what is the actual driver for why that would happen if i believe that it will happen I, if i believe that more and more people will adopt bitcoin such that its value again we think about it in dollar terms but ultimately it will you know at some point in time it will flip um so if there's fundamental demand for bitcoin that there will be increasingly government attempts to restrict that the use of that because it restricts their ability to control power um, and yeah, you know, recognizing that in that world, which what do you, what would you rather? You know, do you really think that you know you, you you would have to have two trains of thought that would be inconsistent with each other? It is left to its own devices. 
Bitcoin will be adopted by a massive amount of people. And because of that, the system as a whole will increase in value because just by the mere fact of more people being a part of it and that that monetary network will have greater diversity of liquidity. Like that is the ultimate value of the network. And the more important would be the, the usage of, of full nodes. I mean, you, you mentioned that in your article you urged or you said somehow it's really important that more and more people, right? Am I correct? Yeah, you, I think well, so. Um, and this is probably a little bit, you know, I think, you know, there's, I think the, the benefit is that, you know, I have a certain view and my view may not be entirely consistent with the majority of people, but, um, you know, there's often a view that people that are quote Bitcoin maximalists or people that think that Bitcoin will be a global reserve currency all think alike, but there's actually a pretty solid degree of, of, uh, disagreement when when people look at you know underneath the hood but i do think that there's there's two things i i think the keys are more important than nodes um because keys are more static than nodes if somebody else has my bitcoin key then some action has to be taken and well it's not my key they're holding my bitcoin and they have their own key and they can choose to either grant me access or not. Um, that is static and absolute. If I, if I want that relationship to change, I'm, de I'm dependent on somebody else. Um, and so I think that Bitcoin is ultimately more secure and more decentralized and, and, and less at risk, more resilient, more anti-fragile, the more keys that exist. Because if, you know, one of the ways to think about nodes is it's important that everyone can run a node and that everyone can validate their, you know, yeah. that the deposits yeah. that they're receiving are, are consistent with the rules of Bitcoin as they understand it. Exactly. But yeah. tomorrow, it's like, when is, a, when is a node actually working? Because is it, is it only when, my, when, I'm, when I'm validating on it that the Bitcoin that are received to the address are actually there? Or is it providing value to the rest of the network perpetually by putting up all these gates of having you know thousands or hundreds of thousands of of assayers of bitcoin that that ultimately create a disincentive for people to subvert the rules and so you know keys and nodes are both important in my view it's because keys are more static and if somebody else holds your keys you have you are dependent on some other action i can have my keys and not have a full node and go get a computer, download software, and spool up a new node. If somebody you know, came to my place of business and shut it down, if I had my keys in, in diverse locations backed up, then I could go get those keys, spin up a new node. If I don't have access to my keys, a node is no good to me, right? And so um, I think both serve functions. Um, both are important. There could be a tragedy of the commons where, you know, sufficient people aren't running nodes and that if, if that's the case and sufficient number of people aren't holding their keys, then a large custodian or a group of large custodians could then um, enforce or influence the rules of Bitcoin and either take, you know, a, a large controlling share of the economic value to some other subset of rules. And so that's why ultimately at the end of the day, you know, it's why you know, I think most people, the longer that they stay in Bitcoin, the more likely they are to hold their own keys, uh, the more likely they are to run their own nodes. Mm -hmm. I kind of think about it without getting political uh, too much, just talking like theory. It's kind of like the, the purpose of the Second Amendment in the United States where you, know, you can agree or disagree um, and people have various different ranges of, 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 of like how they think about it. But at the end of the day, at least how I think about it is, and I'm not, you know, uh, I wish I owned more guns, but, um, you know, the, the, the purpose of it is there's 400 million guns in the United States and there's only 300 million people. The, the, the possibility that um, a, you know, a corrupt government tries to extract its will on, on the people is, there's a much lower probability that that happens because there's so many guns distributed throughout the United States. Um, right. And I think about keys in Bitcoin the same way, that the, the more distributed the economic value um, within the Bitcoin network is, 
and, and actually at a key level, the less likely the network as a whole is to be um, attacked coercively because it's because when people look at that, they you know if all the Bitcoin were held by 200 keys or 200 parties, it'd be easy to go pick off those 200 parties or get sufficient number of them. But if they look around the world and they say they're you know and I as a proxy for this, I look at the number of outputs. So and I've seen some competing numbers, but it's something like 60 million to 90 million outputs. The, the greater number of outputs, if you if you have a Bitcoin key, uh, if, if you want to have your own UTXO, you have to have your own Bitcoin key, essentially. And the more UTXOs there are, you know, the the more distributed. If, if 21 million is a fixed number, as the number of UTXOs increases over time, as adoption increases, and as more people have their own keys, then ultimately the actual economic value of Bitcoin becomes more and more distributed. And it's like those guns spread out throughout the country. They're like, if you want to attack this network, you've got to figure out how to play the game of whack-a-mole that is, you know, 60 to 90 million unspent outputs. And they can pop up anywhere in the world because they can download open source software. Their, their, their node doesn't have to be constantly running. It doesn't even have to be the same node. You just have to be able to connect anywhere to the network. And so I do think, um, you know, nodes are important, but nodes and keys really kind of work hand in hand. And I think if there's something that's more important, it is, it is keys. But, you know, everyone would be better off if people were running nodes and, and having their own keys. Yeah, I guess, you know, when the user experience improves also, I mean, there's a discussion going on constantly on, on Twitter. Uh, also, you know, I think with Peter McCormick, well, you know, I agree with him. It's 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 not easy. You know, it's uh, people don't have the time to, you know, to study to educate themselves. Uh, you know, there's the needs a uh, you know there's a technical intellectual level of uh, required for, for this kind of thing. And 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 uh, if it's a plug and play, of course, you know, people would just buy it, use it, and and you know, and strengthen the network and uh, keep the consensus rules intact. So. Um, yeah. Yeah, so. and I and I think that you know the other piece of that is that and I I, I did listen to um, Peter McCormick and Matt talking about this on their year end review. Um, and I think that Matt brought up a good point is that you know part of it is the economic side of being able to validate your your own you know that your Bitcoin is your Bitcoin. Um, but the other point about it is it's a it's a layer of increasing privacy mm -hmm. um, and that. That ultimately, that you know, your ability to both accept Bitcoin and validate Bitcoin, in, in you know, entirely detached of any other individual or any other party, ultimately makes Bitcoin more censorship resistant. Um, I think that you know, so it you know, recognizing that, and then also recognizing that there is no static level or sufficient level of censorship resistance. There's 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 only market tests, and there's only the fundamental principle that that more is better that that it certainly makes bitcoin more resilient the easier it is for both people to to run nodes but then also the you know the more practical it is in a in a in a standard application i know a lot of people are working on this um and i was i was talking to chris for allen last night um who's who's working on a few applications it's you know i have a node full node running, but then, you know, making it easy for me to uh, connect my wallets or to have my node, you know, it's like most people don't store their Bitcoin on their, on their Bitcoin full node or on their Bitcoin D. Um, and so you, you need to have the ability to have your node that is static and that's consistently up, but that, you know, that the way that you actually store Bitcoin and in, in, in terms of the devices that are or, or the wallets that are generating addresses are connecting with those two nodes and they're they're actually separate um, because people don't you know I think increasingly people will move to to, to uh, multi-sig solutions as, as the value of Bitcoin becomes greater and, and the value at risk becomes greater but then to have those type of uh, storage systems connected to full nodes and communicating with full nodes that individuals run so that you know if, if they if they you know operate as essentially you know kind of watching certain addresses that they'll be able to to marry 
you know, okay, this is the way that I want to store my Bitcoin, but I also want to be able to validate and, and you know, receive or confirm or, or send with my own node. And, and so I think over time that the, the integration of those two things, essentially, you know, recognizing that they likely will be distinct and different, but then integrating them to make it more plug and play and, and easy for um, right. people, users to, to be able to deploy. I think that is an inevitability. Um, it just will take time, but it will also result in Bitcoin being stronger, more censorship resistant and more decentralized. All right. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, um, that's about it. Um, Parker, thanks so much for your time. I have taken up enough time of yours. Um, any, any, any other information like, uh, want to plug in, like I'm going to put your, your, your Twitter handle and your Unchained Capital uh, website. Is, is there any, are there any resources people can look at? Uh, no, I think that that's pretty much it. Uh, Parker A. Lewis on Twitter. Um, not not just my own content, but uh, Phil's, Phil writes some solid right. content, yeah. and, and Drew does as well. So uh, you can always find us on, at the Unchained Capital blog. Um, but yeah, no, just wish wish everyone uh, happy New Year. The, the Genesis block anniversary was yesterday, so uh, yeah, I think I think 2020 is going to be a really exciting year. Um, I, I don't know if the if the happening is priced in, but I'm, I'm sure not going to wait around and. and <laughs> Right. Wait, happy wait New to Year to you too. I'm really looking forward to your next articles. Uh, really excited to you know. Uh, to, uh, but you know, let's you know, we'll, you'll surprise us, I guess. Um, yeah, should should have one out in the next week. All right, looking forward to that. So happy New Year and uh, thank you so much again, Parker. Hope yeah. to talk to you soon. Finally, finally do this. All, All right. right. Have a good day. Bye bye. Yeah. Hey. So what you guys think, I hope you enjoyed it and loved it as much as I did. My talk, my interview with Parker Lewis, Munch and Capital, his articles, I mean, his, 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 his comprehension and, and, and knowledge level is really um, uh, adorable and uh, really fascinating. So check out his articles on Unchained uh, Capital. I'm going to put up the link. I really appreciate it if you share, retweet, repost, or whatever. Or give me a positive review on any podcast platform. And um, yeah, let me know any kind of feedback questions um, for next time. Um, because I'm planning to do, you know, really more of these uh, special, uh, you know, episodes where we really go down the rabbit hole and educate people, you know, about um, why Bitcoin and the essence, the purpose, the vision, and, you know, the fundamental, the properties, and, and why is it also an absolute and inevitable necessity for, you know, for humanity, for, for, for freedom, for pro, pro, prosperity and a monetary revolution on every, on every level you can think of. So, yeah, uh, again, my name is Kevin Avani. I'll talk to you soon again. Thanks so much for listening, for your support, and have a good day. Bye. Mm -hmm.